Burgundy Radio. Nate, we get these we get these fancy cars. Our production team spends no expense. No expense. Joining, joining us as always is the general. I've given you a new nickname, Gerald. I don't know if you want the general. I'm gonna call you the general, Gerald Ashley. Well, um, I've, I've I've come back again for um, once every two weeks. Um, let's see what we talk about today. I've no idea. <laughs> the general then seems appropriate. I think that's good. Perfect. And then joining us, new first time uh, first time participant. Hopefully not the last. The mayor from Columbus, mm-hmm. Ohio, Nate Green, mm-hmm. joining us. How's it going, Nate? It's going great. I'm very excited. I'm here in my bunker in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I'm excited to be here. Excited to join you guys and, you know, talk about all kinds of great happening things around the around the world. Give us uh, for our ten for our ten viewers. Give us uh, a quick run. Well, maybe maybe twelve today. Give you've us got a quick eight, rundown. Got, hey, your... No, 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 no. You've got eight more than I have on my uh, my podcast <laughs> that I do for economic development. So that's <laughs> nice. Eighty percent growth. Yeah, so, yeah. Nate, give us the quick rundown about your background. Why are you joining sure. us today? Yeah, uh, Nate Green. I'm the director of economic development for a group called the Montrose Group, uh, which I've been at for seven years, seven and a half. It's a economic development consulting company based here in Columbus uh, that I'm a partner in. We do um, a lot of work with industrial developers. So all this boom that's going on with e-commerce and e-fulfillment centers, I'm uh, doing a lot of work uh, in uh, in the Midwest uh, to try to get these guys zoned and annexed and tax abatements, all that good stuff. Uh, I am an economic development guy. I've been doing this for 20 some years. So, you know, uh, helping companies find find cheap ways to do business and uh, do it quicker is what I've been doing, what I do. I love it. That's perfect. So that's a good segue to our first topic. We're going to go back across the Atlantic. Cool. The French election. we got Macron, Le Pen, the second round on um, Sunday. Yeah, and uh, what, it was a couple of weeks ago we did the, the first round, which in a way is always a more interesting one uh, because the, the runoff in most years – or most previous elections has been fairly predictable by the the time we get to this sort of Friday before the voting on the Sunday, and I think it's the same again. I think we all pretty much agreed last time that Macron was in the driving seat. Uh, there was uh, a feeling that Madame Le Pen would probably run him a lot closer than last time. Right. Um, I think that narrative still stands and. I don't know if anybody wants to pluck numbers out of the air, but I know, Mark, you're thinking of maybe a 6 or 7% lead for Macron, something like that. So, uh, yeah. Think- By the way, I forgot our fantasy cards. Our France production team will be votes. furious. France votes. Um, yeah, you know, listen, I didn't really know anything. I really don't know. I mean, here I'll say this. In 2015, I randomly, or 2017, I randomly was in Paris a week before the first round, and I became captivated by the French presidential politics. I talked about this last time, and I've just found Macron super interesting. Uh, you know, both Nate and I have been doing government politics stuff for a long time, and the idea of somebody just starting their own party and running, and, um, you know, the Macron story is quite interesting, I find. Absolutely. And, you know, the two-round system, I find it very interesting. You know, our process here in the States, we already have actually people declaring for 24 this week. You know, it's insane. <laughs> so to be able to do it in, like, a month's time, figure your president it's pretty good i i'm also there's two issues i'm interested in obviously the outcome i think macron probably wins by like seven points um but this divide this rural urban divide this globalization white collar blue collar you know i think this is an issue that's resonating certainly here in the states but it looks like it's also Absolutely. continuing in france yeah. i think it's um i think it's even a little why it's a little wider than that in uh, you've got a situation where the major parties over the last five or ten years in France, have pretty much collapsed. So the old Gaullist wing, I mean, they always had various names, and obviously the socialists on the other side have melted away a little bit. And, um, okay, Macron's come through the middle, if he is in the middle uh, yeah. of all of this stuff. Now, we talked last time about um, there are term limits in France. Now, if we were talking about the U.S. election, and um, it was the second election. How many weeks before somebody would say he was a lame duck president? Yeah. I don't actually any. I don't hear anybody saying that Macron's going to be a, a lame duck president in his second term. In fact, it's mainly probably coming his, from his PR machine. But it's all about him being sort of emperor of Europe and uh, making sure that France is well up with Germany, if not ahead of him. But it's it's an interesting dynamic that it's framed that 
he's going to be bigger and greater in the second term. Whether it's, whereas if it was in the United States, they'd been saying, well, you know, power ebbs away quite quickly and all the rest of it. So it'd be interesting to see, I think. Yeah, and I think I think you're right, Drew. I think he's framed himself as the it's interesting the emperor of Europe. He because he's the you know he's trying to broker deals with everybody. He's trying to talk to Russia. He's trying to do all those kind of things. I don't know if it works. Um, I don't know you know what we can do with Putin, but it is kind of amazing how he has positioned himself and what he has really risen up. Right as you know, Angela Merkel is no longer there. He is now the European leader. It's kind of it's fascinating to see how that how that transition has happened and what happens with him going forward. Yeah, yeah one of the, I think, by the sec- or go ahead, Gerald. I was going to say, yeah, I think the other issue here is that um, Herr Schultz in Germany is going to be a fairly weak act. Um, mm-hmm. That's not so much a personal observation as other than the fact that he's got a very unusual coalition. Uh, the bedfellows in his coalition are really quite bizarre from very sort of eco-warrior greens on one end to sort of free market types who hate taxation on the other end. And he's kind of got to he's got to somehow keep that together. Yeah. I think most of his effort is probably in inward looking rather than you know trying to offer leadership in the EU. So I see Macron's got his chance here, but what he'll do with it, um, I've no idea. Yeah, I agree. Well, and you wonder because I'm such a nerd, or maybe because I'm such a professional. I actually watched the debate between Macron and Le Pen. Of course you did. It was of course you did. Hours long. Um, oh. The thing about the Putin thing has been, I think, the big wild card to this, right? I mean, unfortunately, the Ukraine-Putin situation has probably helped Macron. And certainly the reporting here in the States, any mention of Le Pen, there's, you know, there's a connection to Putin. You know, the yeah. whole the Russian bank funding their political party and the allegiance, that famous photo, you know, campaign literature with Le Pen and Putin. Um, it's, in, you know, politics is a long-term thing, but it's also an immediate thing. You know, you wonder if... If Ukraine and Putin isn't happening, does Le Pen possibly win this race? I I would be surprised if she won on Sunday. I think the markets and uh, the world in general would be a bit shocked. But if you haven't got the Ukrainian situation, um, it may have been even closer uh, since. I mean, there's one big group we're not talking about in the French electorate, which is the I don't like any of them group. (laughs) They're kind of big. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody is racing to either of these uh, candidates uh, full of deep joy, other than their immediate supporters. Um, it's a sort of people are voting for who they think is the least worst. And as you say, Mark, it's sort of globalization versus local. It's rural versus you know city slickers and all the rest of it. And um, on balance, I think Macron gets it, but he's he's not. I don't think he's you know, widely loved and admired by the French electorate. I think it also another tell, and this will be our segue to our next topic, is that, you know, Putin, or I'm sorry, Trump has not said anything about Le Pen. Like, I, I would have to think if Trump thought Le Pen was going to win or do really well, he'd be out there claiming that he annoyed her and he helped her and all these good things. So the fact that Trump is quiet on this might be the sign that the Le Pen... Tells, tells you that she isn't going to, she doesn't have a chance. Yeah, might be the yeah. tell that there's not the uh, support, yeah. but we'll right. see. I guess we'll know early on Sunday. We'll, we should know Sunday, I guess, 7 o'clock local time in Paris, which is... You're going to be following be, the uh, elections. You're going to be on, like, uh, Mark, you're going to be, you know... I'll be live snapping it. I'll be, li- I'll, be outside the, I'll be outside the French embassy live snapping. So follow Hello. me on TikTok or Snapple or uh, Snapple. Snapple, you know, Snapple. <laughs> follow, follow yeah. I, had, Snapple. I had one of those at lunch the other day. Yeah, I'll follow I think um, I think that's an offer I can easily resist. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's pivot to Ohio and Trump. Uh, I think we've got a big Senate primary coming up in early May, and May the third, May the May the third, May the third. Yeah, very. Um, I think too. This is, I think what to me is interesting about the French election is like the impact it has on the U.S., but also in the U.K. Just kind of the uh, the results. This kind of us versus them mentality. Let's have a quick rundown of Ohio, Nate. What's happening? Trump made a big endorsement of J.D. Vance. Trump endorsed endorsed J.D. Vance. You know, kind of surprising, but not that surprising. I mean, J.D. Vance is never uh, – he's never he, – he's not the guy that has come out as I'm the Trumpiest of all. Uh, Josh mm-hmm. Mandel is the Trumpiest of all. He's also um, – 
Well, I don't like Josh Mandel, and I think there's a lot of people that don't. He's the most, uh, you know, uh, he's just he's he's awful. He's obnoxious. He's obnoxious. He's a, well, but he's just yeah. the things that he says and does. It's you know, he get tried to get in a fight with the other guy, Mike Gibbons, who's running, and Mike Gibbons has zero shot, even though he's got the most money of anybody in the race. Um, JD Vance is the most polished. He's the least political. I think he's the least. Uh, he if you watch him from just an issue standpoint, I don't know what he stands for, but. He is um, he, he kind of looks the most senatorial, if that's a word, of any of the candidates. Yeah, uh, he um, he you know, he's got a great background. He went to Yale. He's a he's a venture capitalist. He's from Ohio. He's from, you know, you talk about urban versus rural. He's from a rural area. Right. Uh, he's from, you know, his family's originally from Appalachian. Then he grew up in Middletown over near between Cincinnati and Dayton, literally in the middle of uh, Cincinnati and Dayton. Uh, which is, I mean, he, he grew up, his mother, um, uh, you know, was, was a drug addict, all those kind of things. I mean, he makes a great story. Um, he was, uh, I think, and Mark, you probably know this, but I, I think he actually was running, I, he might've been running third in the polls behind Mandel and Timken, or he was running second behind Mandel. I, I can't remember, but yeah, he certainly wasn't at the top. And it was right. it was quite surprising that, um, Trump endorsed them and yeah. there could be some Peter Thiel connections. I think yep. what's interesting we want to get you here on this, Gerald. Obviously, Ohio, I still think it's a background state. You know, maybe it's, it's trending to the Republicans, but Ohio is a super interesting state. You've got Honda, you've got manufacturing, yep. you've got the Ohio State University, which is as American as apple pie, yep. you have P&G, you have biotech. You know, to me, it's a very diversified economy. It's one of the largest economies in the world. Um, and it's an important yeah. race. It's always, it's like this test tube of these various political themes are flowing. I was going to sort of make an observation as an obvious outsider here. Is this a good litmus test for the national mood and what's going on, or is it still pretty much Midwest and regional? That's a good, you know, Gerald. That's a great question. I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm almost, I'm, you know, I live here. It's a little too much. I see all the TV ads. I, I can't, I can't tell you. I don't really, you know, it. I don't know, Mark. I don't know what you think. You're, you know, you you're you see it from a national perspective. I, I don't know, Gerald. I'd say no. I, I mean, I don't be only because it's weird. These people. I don't know any of these people. I don't really. I mean, I know Josh Mandel. I can't think that it's a litmus litmus test for the for the nation. Um, it's like that Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. Is that a litmus test for a guy that just was on t- TV being a you know senator? I I don't think it is. I don't think it's a litmus test. I mean, I hope. I mean, I, I mean, I want JD Vance to win actually now because he's the he's the least awful of all of them. I mean, the best one is Matt Dolan, but there's no way he's going to win. So, so we're we we've got the same background as France. We're looking at the least awful. The, yes, the yes. This, this yes. is a big theme, I think. You see, I think this is a big theme in Western democracies that we we. I know it's a bit of a trope to go on about how we're hijacked by you know professional politicians. We certainly are in in the UK. And um, the general public rarely warms to any of these guys, really. Yeah. Um, but but nationally, Mark, where, where's all this leading to? I suppose it's the autumn and the primaries. <clears throat> well, I do think I do think both Ohio and Pennsylvania are super important because for two reasons. I think they're equally split. Like there's very dynamic leaders in the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, frankly. I mean, if you look at a list of Democrat candidates for president in 2024, Sherrod Brown. The senator from Ohio is in the top 10, for sure. Very dynamic, well-respected. But he's the polar opposite of a J.D. Vance, right? I mean, and then you go across to Pennsylvania, you have the uh, lieutenant governor, I forget his name right now, Democrat. You know, he dresses in basically uh, blue-collar gear. And he's he goes against, out and, I mean, he goes out in gym shorts and, and right. you know, T-shirts. To, to man of the people. Every man, yeah. And Oz, you know, has got a very interesting background. So I think to, it's interesting what you said, Joe. I think we're having like these extreme politicians, right, that are winning these kind of primaries, mm. and they're then suddenly having to race to the middle. Maybe it's because the political parties are losing power, and they're just they're almost collapsing inside of themselves. Hence, you've got more more polarized candidates that are winning these primaries. You know, I, I guess I would be interested in both your opinion on on getting past the primary, you know, whoever wins, if it's JD Vance or Josh Mandel in Ohio, you know, and Mark, you're you know this well, the guy that is gonna uh, be the Democratic nominee is a guy named Tim Ryan. Yeah, uh, Joe, we know I, him as a side story, we went to school, we went to Bowling Green University with Tim Ryan. We know him yeah. quite well. It's pretty yeah. amazing. 
What's interesting though is he's running every ad that he runs is uh, about against China. China's war, China's the the devil. China's China's awful. Globalization is awful, right? So it's almost like this. He's taken that, and it's weird. It's weird for me to watch it. It's almost like he's taking this Trump mantra. You've all been left behind in the rural areas, in the manufacturing areas. Tr- China's the worst thing ever. So I I don't know how that spin, how that'll how that'll play with. The Republicans that are trying to be, you know, trying to trying to be Trump. I, I think that I, I guess I'm interested in what you guys think of how that's going to play out in the just in the general in everywhere, not just in Ohio. I just see it in Ohio. Well, you know, Joe, I'll throw this to you because it's an interesting year this week. Your prime minister's in India looking for trade deals. And I think about Ohio, getting back to Ohio, you Procter & Gamble, one of their, they're, they're an international company. They're like a world class international company. And one of the best Ohio employers is a Japanese company. By Honda, like, yeah. you know, we've got our politicians have selective thinking around globalization, right, which is interesting. And nobody seems to be defending globalization. And yeah. then, you know, we got Boris Johnson in India looking for trade deals. Well, I, you know, I mean, everybody hates globalization or says so until they find their delivery from Amazon is going to take a month because <laughs> of the supply chain. <laughs> right. I, you know, I think, I, I, and, and we're all kind of guilty of this to an extent. We, we want to keep the wealth local, but we want the benefits of everything coming from the rest of the world. And it's, you know, the simple fact that's, that's not a, a circle you can square. Um, one of the games I think that goes on a lot um, with Western democracies, again, is they're looking for short-term uh, overseas investment all the time. So Boris is in Boris is in India, and it's it, everybody knows it's not really going to go anywhere this particular trip because um, the Indians are only going to open up their markets and put more direct investment into the UK if we relax our immigration policy towards Indian nationals, and that's just not going to happen. And so we have these conversations that will go round and round, and. Um, we've got into a world where politicians dress up. So Monsieur Macron dresses up now in all sorts of gear. Uh, Boris can barely resist putting on a yellow high visibility jacket. He's clambering. In I'm laughing. It's so funny. You see him in that like once a week. It's hilarious. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, don't you feel we kind of seen through all this stuff now? Yeah. And I, yeah. I think, People are kind of tired of all these antics that I know, Mark, you always say the bat, you know, the context is important. If you're going to talk about farm policy, get down and stroke a cow or be with the or whatever. You know. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think people think this is all a bit facile. And I think it feeds into this thing of they're all the same, really, you know, Republican, Democrat, Labour, Tory, whatever it may be. And so I think there's a general, there's a general, um, dissatisfaction with the party system actually yeah maybe we are re- ready for a big review and like our politics has become too amateur or not amateur but too clownish right like too clownish. We're playing these parts we're not having serious conversations and they, i mean I well, think nobody steps work, up nobody steps I, up there's no leaders either and that and that's not and i'll tell you that's not even that's that's at the local level up to the national level i mean yeah. that's a problem there's no there's no real leaders anymore it's whoever can show the other person up and whoever can be the biggest clown i mean that's and it's a problem we you know, we, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, there are still great leaders, but it's, that's not the, you don't want to be a leader anymore. Now you got to be the best guy on Twitter. You got to be the best guy in the Snapple or whatever. I'm joking. The Snapple. The Snapple. I know we're, we're going to buy the Snapple. The Snapple, but you know, (laughs) or you got to be the best TikTok dancer. You know, it's not about substance. And I think they have, we've lost that. And we've, and, and I think Gerald, to your point, it's not for us in the U S it's not just us. You're seeing it, you know, over there as well. Yeah. I think, um, it's a small, a national hobby in Britain to blame everything on America, <laughs> and um, let's 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 blame America for this one. Which I wonder if this really goes back in ancient history to the famous debate of Nixon versus Kennedy, and we all know the story that you know Kennedy looked great on television and TV audience thought he won the debate, and on radio um, Nixon was sounded better and all the rest of it. And it, maybe it's the, the fault is with us as the, the electorate. We, we, we buy the smooth talker who looks slick, looks good. Yeah. Yeah. But does yeah. that mean they're actually any good at running a government? And yeah. I think you're right. I mean, that's, you know, if you even look at, 
going back to Trump and how he got elected, he didn't, I don't think he really cares about any of the people that voted for him, but he said the right things and he looked the right way. And that's how he got elected. I mean, that's, you're yeah. right. It's celebrity politics anymore. Not, uh, not substance politics. I think we might have a uh, structural problem too. Like I've been noodling on this idea, like here in the States, we should probably add a year to every term, right? For the yeah. house, three year term, Senate, seven, president five um you know nate i don't want you totally talk out of school but you know you work for some high profile governors and they're like hey man i'm only here for let's say four years and i only got really two years to get this done and you've done a lot of foreign direct investment in the u.s yeah. and sure there's opportunities all over the world but is you've got contacts in germany you got contacts in the uk you got contacts in korea why am i going to go to india china when i you know it's going to take time i don't know having more time in office might be might be the key. Well, and it's, I think it's, a you know, again, I'm sorry that it's, it's so a parochial and I'm going to give you an Ohio example, but we had term limits. We, we decided to have term limits in the nineties that we voted, the electric electorate voted to give the house and the Senate term limits. They didn't used to, they, they, you know, forever that you could be a, Vern Reif was our speaker of our house for like 25 years. Well, you can't do that anymore because you can only be in the house of the Senate for 12 years. Well, that is, and I think Mark, that has created mm -hmm. that, um, it's amateur hour and it's amateur hour at every level. And so no longer do you have these people that are really interested in it for good public policy and being a great, I mean, you still have some of those, but by and large, it's how can I get to the next office? How can I get the best TikTok or Twitter? And they're not, they're, well, they're not in, they're not in it for the long term. And Mark, they're not in it. The governors, I think we still have across the states, a lot of great governors that are doing great things. But, you know, down from that term limits, these term limits have created a backlash where you just people aren't they're They're in it to be for the show. They're not in it for the for the substance. Yeah, of the, I, or, I guess or those kind of things. I guess with four years, it's an idea I've not heard before. And it's a really interesting one, because with four years in the States, as you say, it's only the middle two years, year two and three, that you can actually get any work done. The rest Absolutely. is all campaigning and electioneering. You know, I work for, uh, Mark knows this, I worked for John Kasich. He was the governor. Uh, he was our last governor of Ohio. Great guy, but, you know, he ran, he, in his second term, he ran for president. And he just, nothing got done in Ohio. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's. I mean, I don't want to say that totally, but he lost his, his Ohio focus because now he's running for president. And part of that's because he had, you know, well, he wanted to be president, but part of it's because he was a ter he's term limited and he couldn't do anything after that. That was it. Mm. Yeah, here in Virginia, you can only be governor for four years. And, you know, Youngkin, who's not even been in office for uh, four months, is already <laughs> trying to find a way for his next job in 24. It's, it's bizarre. It's you know, you, you wouldn't put somebody – you wouldn't – you know, Mark, you mentioned P&G, right? You wouldn't put a CEO in at P&G and say, you've got three years to get everything done, and then you're done. Yeah. They do say, yeah, you've got three years to get everything done, but if you're good after three years, we'll give you the – you know, we'll give you $300 million, and, and you know, you'll have another three years. You wouldn't do that. So, okay, but, ah, you know, we'll do that to our politicians because we don't trust them, so we're going to kick them out of office. Well, you can't get anything done in that short amount of time. It's like having a queen for 70 years, a monarch. Every country well, should have a monarch for 70 years. I can give you a historical example, uh, two or three of these, where um, government in Venice was always difficult because they had a, a, a different doge every year. Um, and believe it or not, the kings of Poland used to be elected um, and that didn't work out very well. Um, I, you know, if you're going to have a dictatorship, okay, make it a benign one, but don't make it just one for four years. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's a good rule of thumb. <clears throat> Let's go to our next topic. Office spaces, our favorite topic. We all love offices. We all love commercial real estate. Um, I've been working for home for five years. I've had co-working spaces, but I haven't been in an office maybe a handful of times but I must say, I miss going into the city. I love big cities. I love London. I love Cleveland. I love Columbus. I love D.C. I love being in urban cores. But is that over? Is the dream over? Are the power lunches over? Are the big corner suites over? I don't, well, you, I, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I went through. We have a company here called Cover My Meds. They were bought by McKesson uh, for $1.5 billion four years ago. They built this monolithic headquarters and it's huge. I mean, it's massive. It, it looks like a spaceship. And I went through it the other day and you know, I'm old, right? I have a corner office in my office. I'm not in it today, but I have one downtown. So I went through this thing and it's this, everything's open. You know, all you see is this sea of 
of uh, desks with monitors. And then that, there wasn't anybody there, right? It was 4.30 in the afternoon and nobody was there. And then they've got these conference rooms that are themed and it's the most bizarre theme. They had a Star Trek theme one and they had this medieval themed one. <laughs> and, I, you know, maybe I'm just old, maybe I'm just a curmudgeon, but I'm like, who in the hell wants to work in these places? I mean, I, I really, it was bizarre. I, I get distracted when I'm sitting here by myself and I see something on the TV that I watch for the next 10 minutes. So I don't know how you, I don't know how that works. However, what I will say is that those people that are there that are in their twenties, thirties, and forties, they love those spaces. And I think if we are, first off, I think people, from my perspective, companies are going to move back to the office. They may not move back full time for five days a week, but every one of my clients that has an office, they are moving to a, you come in two or three days a week, and then you can stay home the other two or three days a week. That yeah. is, Cover My Meds is doing that. There's a company here called Root Insurance doing that. Gerald, we talked about Nationwide Insurance. They're doing that. Every one of those companies is doing that. <clears throat> so I think that, I think we are moving in a different direction with offices. And I can just tell you that from the companies that I'm talking to. Um, I think, Mark, I read, I, I'm fascinated. There was an article you put in the Brigadoon the other day. It was from, uh, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm hopefully I can find it here. It was that Quartz office, Car yeah. Quartz article. <clears throat> yeah. The title is what's in store for empty downtown office buildings. And I, you know, the, the most fascinating thing to me was they're going to, a lot of them are going to go to residential. That's going to happen. Hmm. But they talked about doing multi-story industrial in these areas. I'm like, holy crap, that would be awesome. And I think yeah, that is wow. crazy. Wow. Yeah. I mean, wasn't, uh, we go back again in history to the River Rouge plant before. Yeah. That was that was on a multi-story basis, was it not? It was like four, the, I think it was four stories, Gerald. You're exactly yeah, right. Yeah, and the famous the famous building uh, in Turin. At the yeah, the, the Fiat plant. Yeah, yeah. with the, the racing track on the roof yeah. and all the rest of it, which is still there. Some friends of mine were there a few years ago, and there were no tourists at all because it features in a very famous British film called The Italian Job, but the locals don't appreciate it in the way the British tourists do. But, um, yeah, the idea of vertical factories, that's, that sounds kind of interesting. I, I, it's, it's awesome. I mean, you know, we've, we've in America, we have for so long, we've had this sprawl and we just keep going out and we keep building 2 million square feet, 3 million square feet. And then you get like 40 minutes from the downtown or an hour from the downtown and you just, it just it makes no sense. But we now we have all these brownfield spaces, the River Rouge plant, where I can't remember who is there now. Is it? Uh, it's still Ford. Is it Ford, Mark, or somebody? Mm. Oh, I'm That's thinking still, of. Yeah, there's a GM a plant, plant that I think somebody else bought, but I can't think of who it is. Mm. But anyway, that's it's. I, uh, I, I I love it. I hope that that happens. I mean that that vertical manufacturing you, or distribution, man. It's. I think yeah, that, that's other, awesome. The other one, which always gets talked about, it's in the, it's in the filing cabinet of flying cars. Uh, so it's always talked about will never happen. But you know when people talk about vertical farming. Where we have yeah. this idea, you use hydroponics, and uh, uh, you can grow tomatoes on the twenty-fourth floor, and all the rest of it. I, uh, I'm surprised somebody hasn't tried that and lost a lot of money doing it. But they probably well, should. I'll tell you, Gerald, I'm having, I'm, at, I'm going to a conference in Kansas City uh, Sunday through Tuesday, and I'm moderating a panel about vertical farming. Oh, good! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> With the guy, this company is called Aero Farms. They. Uh, um, they only do urban, like they don't do, they don't go out and they build these, these multi-story facilities. Um, and they go into places where it, they're brownfields. I mean, they're, they're places where there used to be something, they tore down yeah. a building. Yeah, so yeah. that is, it's a trend. These and it's what's, <laughs> these guys are making all kinds of money because it's the, the it's like this, um, like far, uh, farm to table or whatever, you know, that local thing, like, Hey, it's made right here. And then yeah. it goes right to your right to your market or whatever. Yeah, yeah it's, I, have uh, this, I have this rather more quaint idea of a local farm, not exactly 25 stories high, but if it's low. <laughs> me too, me too. But it is, ever, I, it's funny you bring that up because yeah, I, I literally am, am posting it and I was talking to the guy, the, the COO of the company the other day about how they do it. It's kind of interesting. I think about too, like it's interesting the whole work, like say there's a five day work week we have here in the West. And everybody's like, you got to be in the office two or three days, right? But nobody wants to work on Friday, right? right. So why, why, why are we saying, hey, you got a four-day work week? You know, like, I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I don't know anybody who's like, my in-office day is Friday, right? Nobody. Nobody's saying that. And so, if they do, they go in, they work in the morning, and then they're done. 
it's interesting. Like, are we not prepared? And maybe, I don't know, we're a generation away. Like, do you, or maybe companies are going to say, listen, we're just going four days a week and you're going to work 10 hours or 12 hours. Or Yeah, I think that's going to come. And I, I, I'm struggling to name the company, but there have been a couple of large Scandinavian companies who looked at this. I think maybe the electronics company Ericsson is one of them. Hmm. And they literally say, we're just going to knock Friday on the head and um, make it a four-day run. I can see that coming, actually. I can too. Well, I didn't I read something recently in California. They're trying to regulate that it's only 32 hours and you work four days a week. That's, a, I think, the legislature there. Mark, your, your favorite state. I thought that you'd be on top of that. I love California. I'm actually trying to, I'm trying to advocate a 22-hour work week. So. <laughs> I think you could. But, you know, I think you're right. It's interesting, too, that, you know, the four-day work week, People work all the time too. They don't just work four days. They work at night and they work on the weekends. So do we well, really need to? Yeah, yeah. We saw this industrial, that. like an industrial mindset, don't we? Like, that's the yeah. other thing that's happened is that it's not working from home, is it? It's living at work. Yeah. And I think I think that's that's a, a social issue. Yeah. That, you know, you don't going back to your earlier point, Nate. You know, you want to go into town. You want to see people. You want to sort of bump into people, even if it's just to argue with people and remind yourself how much you hate somebody. Who's <laughs> um, but, you know, you want, you, want to, you want to do all of those things. Yeah, but absolutely. there's a huge number of people who are sort of electronic battery hens who are mm -hmm. sitting in uh, a very small space and not connecting. And I, I, I think that's bad on lots of levels, actually. No, I agree. Yeah, I going agree. into an office to Zoom with other people <laughs> seems like very yeah, no, I, bizarre. I, um, I have some colleagues who went to uh, a large US investment bank in London and they've got some limit on how many people are in a room so they literally had other people in the next door room via Zoom I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is insanity <laughs> that makes no sense so, we're in the same space and yet we can't be in the same room are we pro but, so let me do a two part question here before we close out to our next segment are we pro urban cores in the short term and or is it gonna be a hotbed of innovation i guess you know what what, what do we see with these urban cores like canary wharf in london yeah, what's I, gonna happen i mean if you look at the skyline of london i was in london a couple of days ago and see the skyline from where i was very well there's a huge amount of building going on in the old city of london area um lord knows who's going to fill all this space but then we've been saying that for the last 30 years but I do feel there is there's some sort of, you know, bigger change going on now. Um, I guess there's still demand and people are still paying rent to be in there. But equally, you do hear of large companies getting rid of large amounts of space. Um, the big accounting firms in the UK, sort of E&Y, PwC, Deloitte, these sort of guys, they've been at the forefront of scaling back physical office space in a big way. And London doesn't feel busy when you're there. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's occupied. There are people there, but it, it's not bursting at the seams. Um, and so who's putting capital into building 25-story, 30-story concrete buildings? I don't know, but they are. Somebody's doing it. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I mean, it, if you just look at, if you look at trends in development, whether it's uh, residential, mixed use, or um, industrial development, it's actually moving. I mean, there's still a lot of uh, greenfield development, but there's there's there seems to be more of a focus in the last few years in the U.S. No matter where you go, it's all over the place of of filling in the urban core, going back into spaces, uh, reusing spaces, doing brownfield redevelopments. Um, you know, I told you I'm going to Kansas City. Kansas City is interesting. It's a it's a it's a great Midwestern town that actually has a lot of Western California influences in it. Um, but that urban core there, they've done a great job of they've got all kinds of new new apartments going up. But then they, they're reusing all of their industrial spaces for office. I'm staying in a hotel that's an old manufacturing space. Um, I think that that I really do. I, I think that that from all of my clients from all of the work I do with companies and communities, that urban core, we are, we are, that's a trend that's going back the other day way, which is, I mean, I, you know, I live four and a half miles from downtown. I, I love the, the more urban environment anyway, so I'm all for it. Yeah. All right. Our favorite segment. I don't know if Read. it's our viewers favorite segment, but what we're reading and watching Nate, usually by history, the guest goes first, but you're allowed to uh, pass. We can come back to you if you're not, if you're not prepared. 
No, no, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, no. Oh, no. Here we go. Here we go. Well, I'm actually, I started a book. So now this is just books. And I'll tell I mean, I read every day. I read the Wall Street Journal, right? Okay. Because, and I watch CNBC. It's not, listen, it's not confessional. Okay. You're not talking those, to your priest. Those not, are the this, things this, I want. This isn't a, this isn't a confessional. Uh, if I, you yeah, can, no, you can hey. talk about anything. It doesn't matter. There's no judgment I mean, I here. Read, I, so I read stupid books, right? I'll be like stupid <laughs> spy novels. I do that all the time because I can read them in like two days. Uh, I was at Valley Forge over Thanksgiving. Whoa. And I'm reading the Newt Gingrich book about Valley Forge. That's one of the nice. books I'm reading by right now. It's, you know, it's just amazing that whole, you know, they spent the winter there. They thought the, that they, the war was over. They, you know, I mean, Gerald, we thought, you know, the British had killed them, that they were, they were, we were going to be done. And then they, you know, cool. kind of a, came out victorious out, out of that. I'm just starting into it, but it's a fascinating book. And, you know, it's a Newt Gingrich book, which is like, he actually is a pretty good writer when he writes with other people. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm reading right now. I've been to uh, Bucks County where uh, Washington and the Hessians crossed the Delaware. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, it's a pretty, it was a pivotal moment. And what an amazing war. One of my favorite wars, the Revolutionary War. <laughs> well, Absolutely. you know, I, I, I've heard a term about it recently, which. <laughs> oh, no, here we go. Which has probably <laughs> upset you two guys. <laughs> but um, that's my sole purpose of being here, of course. Um, is that, okay, it's the American War of Independence, but in a way, it was a British Civil War. Mm -hmm. We talk no, about the English Civil War, but it, yeah. in a way, it was a British Civil War. Absolutely. No, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, War of 1812 fan, not fan, or study or history. And I was, that's a Civil War as well. Yeah, no, you can make yeah. the case, that certainly, that the Revolutionary yeah. War, the War yeah. of Independence. Uh, the War of Independence. Well, so far, you seem to be managing without us, so I suppose, you know. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I, don't that's know, the case. I don't know. We might want to. We might want to go back <laughs> under. We might want to come back over. There right, probably, if there was a referendum, I'm sure several states would leave the union and rejoin yeah. London within, Absolutely. within yeah, days. I think, Mark, I think Mark would let, rather go back and be part of the uh, be part of Europe. I, you know, I'm just saying. I, I'm 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 all for it too. I you know I it's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I live in the, you know, I live in the belly of the beast here in the Midwest for the crazy. It's tough. It's tough governing yourself. It really is. <laughs> well, in, on, on the history theme, um, I, um, uh, my, my book this week is the same as a film. Last night, I went and saw the film Operation Mincemeat, which is this film, uh, Second World War thriller. Yeah. Uh, with Colin it's, on Netflix, it's on Netflix over here. I want to see yeah, that. And it's a Netflix it release in the States. It's in cinemas or whatever over here. Um I think to a lot of people in the UK, it's a well-known story because it was quite a famous 1950s film called The Man Who Never Was. Um, but it's well done. It's a, re a remake and it's updated because the original film uh, was before a lot of the secrets came out about Ultra um, mm. in the mid-1970s. So the, the first film was a bit coy about how it actually worked. Very briefly, um, use a dead body, put in some secret documents with misleading information, hope the Germans will read it and redirect their forces. Um, the book is also called Operation Mincemeat. Um, I've got some sort of sales label on here. So I'm also got, you got, apparently, you got, a, you got a deal on that book. I got a deal on this. Um, <laughs> but I would also recommend uh, Ben McIntyre, the author. Huh. Uh, he's written some really good books in a in a similar vein. There's a very good book called, um, uh, I want to say it's called Operation Sonia or Red Sonia. It's about, it's about a um, communist spy in the, in the UK. And um, he, he's, uh, he's well worth, um, he's well worth reading. There's three or four of his books. So Operation Mincemeat um, cool. wasn't a news story to me, would be a, a news story to a lot of people. Good yeah. film, but a, but a really excellent book. Gerald, I'm just happy to see that you have the actual book. I know Mark does too. I'm see you guys. I I have this Valley Forge book on my phone. That's on your I'm phone. Oh phone. my! I read no, it on my I phone don't. and I read it on my iPad because then I, I have it with me all I the time. Think, yeah, that doesn't count. I'm afraid. I, think. <laughs> I got all the books on my phone. All these books. I don't even. I you know that's what I read. It's it's it's. So it's, what happens to your life when there's a power cut? <laughs> Well, then I pull out the old books that I have, Drew. But I say that I've read that I haven't read. I mean, that's what I actually, that's what happens then. <laughs> so I'm Mark, reading. So I'm, Mark, you, are you allowed to borrow any books anymore? Or has Karen told you that you're done? Uh, I mean, that, you know. Don't, don't. Yeah. <laughs> I stopped buying books, man. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, what are you talking about? I don't buy books. Um, I can't read. So 
I've actually been kind of geeking out like algorithms and code. And uh, I just read this cool book by Clive Thompson called Smarter Than You Think. <clears throat> it's about machine learning and technology. He basically makes the case that technology is helping us. We shouldn't be afraid of it. And, um, you know, like we can use data to like help us make better decisions. Pretty easy, quick read. It's basically like a big wired article. But that was a good book. And then a deeper dive, Lawrence Lessing, who's a professor at Harvard Law School, he wrote this book called Code and Code and Cyber Laws, and uh, this is an updated version. But this really goes into the connection between legal text and code. Basically, he's like um, code and le code and law are the same thing. So we've got the law, which is like East Coast code, right, like the Bill of Rights, and then you got West Coast law, which is code, and the connection of it. And um, it's really helped my thinking and. It's very powerful. It's a bit uh, deep dive, but it really, for the future of the world, understanding how deal. these things work, uh, yeah. it's been really helpful. Yeah. Is it going to strip out a lot of legal jobs that AI and machine learning will do a lot of the donkey work in, in legal work, do you think, Mark? Well, I think like what Clive Thompson is saying too, and Mark Andreessen has basically said this, is like going to be three types of people, right? Either people that are going to be controlled by code people that are actually going to code and then people yeah. that are going to use code. Right. Yeah. And I think Lessing would be, you know, with the background of Harvard law would say, you know, this we're is the opportunity to think about how to like, we're all in trouble when the machine writes the code though. Aren't we? That's the problem. That's right. Well, that's the rub. Right. And like, but not being intimidated by it, like Clive Thompson's book has been interesting too, because computers right now, you know, they really operate just on brute force because they just got the, the brain power to really focus. Yeah, yeah. And but at the same time, like if the if the computer lab is on fire, the computer doesn't know to leave the room, right? Yeah, because so it doesn't computer... have a, it has no it has no thinking. It's interesting, you know. I and this is Mark. This is specific to one thing. I I wonder. I, I I've been wondering recently. Four three or four years ago, everything was about self driving cars, right? And how AI was going to take that over. And it's kind of interesting to me. And I don't know if it's it's in this book or not. These books you're reading, I. I haven't heard about self-driving cars recently. I mean, seriously, it's not a, it's not a thing. We don't hear about the Google cars anymore or the, the, so I don't know if we're, if that's just, we've moved on to something else and that was a trend or what? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting. That, I mean, they've been focused on those, but I just think it's like the amount of data that's necessary yeah. to like drive is like unprecedented. Yeah. And it's like a, the it's, connections it's, needed and yeah, um, yeah I, mean, a, I, I, I would file it under too hard. I think there are many, many other applications like analysis of medical data, you know, yeah. this idea of, of scanning the body and then using AI to sort of uh, add up uh, all the bits and pieces as to what. And it's, you know, that's, I think you're, uh, Gerald, that's, I, I would agree. I think that it is too hard and it's gotten to the point they're like, we just can't, we can't tackle it. It's too hard and takes too much money. I, I think that's probably. Yeah. Well, in the data analysis too, like a, a child, a, a one-year-old child knows the difference between a cat and a dog, right? Yeah. But a computer doesn't know the difference until it's like fed tons of data. So like in some Thousands ways. of lines of code, yeah. There are certain applications that computers can do better or machines, but that humans like driving yeah. is like, yeah. I don't see how we get out of that space. I, I don't either, unless you have. I mean, the only way to do the only way that the only thing I think that it could replace is truck driving on yeah, like, yeah. If you're because in the then desert, you're if you're in the desert, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because then you're staying. You know, you're in the right lane. You're staying straight. You 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 know you have to get off, and then you can have somebody take over from there. Yeah. But the last mile, I don't see how you can. You know, I, I can't really imagine know. an autonomous car in London or Rome. You know, no, I mean, it's just not. No, it's, no it's, it, it's, it's not practical. I mean, you know, even starting with the buses would be really difficult. Um, yeah. Just one final sort of link or shout out uh, as some, uh, for people to take a look at. Um, they're on Twitter. They've got web pages, all the rest of it. But if you go to the Santa Fe Institute, they're yeah. absolutely the guys on this sort of thinking on huh. uh, AI, uh, machine learning, the difference between the two and what's coming. And... Um, I'm trying to rack my brains the name of the particular professor, but uh, she's called Melanie something. But there's a lot of there's a lot of very good stuff on the Santa Fe Institute website for people to check that out. That's a good good call. Yeah, that's a good think tank, and Santa Fe is a lovely place. So it is. That's a good end. Maybe the next time we could all meet there and do this in person. Santa Fe, <laughs> there we New go. Mexico. The that's Enchanted a great idea. State. Yeah, well, I like it. To our friends in Italy, we're still waiting for a contract. Thankfully, we didn't reach out to CNN Plus. 
Nate, you studied in Italy. Don't you have contacts there? Can you help us? I do. I'll make, some calls. I'll make yeah. some calls. I'll see if I can put something together. Yeah. yeah. Get us yeah. Uh, Get us a deal. We're ready to yeah. go to Italy. I'm on it. I'm on it. I'll do it. We're not We're not desperate, desperate, but we are keen. <laughs> but you're close. I'll do it. I'll, I'll make some calls today. I'll see what I can put together. <laughs> All right, boys. Thanks for uh, making the time. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on, guys. I'll uh, hey, I'll do it again anytime you want that I can uh, that I can make it work. Well, we'll have to talk to our production team, but you know, I think you did. I well, think you did pretty good. That crack conduction production team you have with the with the sticks is really, Mark. I mean, that's <laughs> it's a, I like it's, it. a, it's a high it's a high budget uh, high budget. Yeah, well, I like the high budget stuff, Gerald. I'm really I'm fancy. I, you know, I got all my I got all my makeup on today. I'm I'm good. <laughs> All right, boys. We'll see you Thanks, soon. Guys, Gerald, good to talk to you. Good to meet you. Mark, always good to see you. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks All for right. joining me. Thanks, guys.